is up guys welcome back to life on there's happy friday uh, another legend in, wa in watchmaking that's who, what we're going to be discussing today um, today we're going to be discussing ferdinand betu um, he is um, one of the most iconic um, watch uh, watch uh, makers within the, the history of watch uh, within watches he's known for his wide set of work especially with within the um within uh writing books and, and educating those on, on how watchmaking should be done, but he's also known for the creation of the C, uh, for his uh, C chronometers that he created. Um, so that's who we're gonna be discussing today. We've discussed some other watchmakers, um, so if you like learning about significant watchmakers within the history of, um, of, uh, of watchmaking, be sure to check those out. Um, we have a playlist where we discuss all of them. But before we get into that, and I say to every video, be sure to smash that like button for us. Smash it for Ferdinand Bia too. And also, when you're right by that uh, like button, the subscribe button is really close by as well. So, like I said, Ferdinand Bia too is known for his wide set of work, especially within uh, the scholarly work that he did and the books that he wrote about watchmaking. But he's also known for sea chronometers. Um, Bia too was born um, in, um, in uh, 1727 on um, the 18th of March um, in uh, Neuchâtel, the canton of Neuchâtel. Um, his father was a carpenter and architect and he actually had four brothers and a sister. Um, his brothers also went into watchmaking and he ended up being a, an apprentice for his, his brother. Um, in 1741, which was kind of when his uh, watchmaking uh, life kind of started, um, at age 14 he became a, a clockmaking apprentice to one of his brothers. And he, at the same time, he was also studying science at one of the um, schools um, close by. And then in 1745, he moved to Paris to improve some of his skills within watchmaking. Uh, Paris was an extremely significant uh, place to go if you were interested in, in studying watches um, because it seemed like all of the great minds and great engineers were, were located there. Um, so he continued to study watchmaking and then in 1753, um, by order of the French uh, Royal Council, he received the title of Master Watchmaker, so he completed his apprenticeship and ended up becoming a full-time watchmaker. Um, so, continued to make watches, continued to study um, watchmaking and how to put these pieces together, and really drew attention of a lot of very significant people. Um, some of them being watchmakers themselves, like uh, Breguet, but one of the more important um, people uh, especially if you are a, a watchmaker, was uh, the French king. So the French king in uh, 1763 asked Bertu if he could make um, sea clocks um, for, um, for the uh, French Navy. And um, he asked if he would go, uh, the king asked if Bertu would go to uh, John Harrison and see one of his sea clocks that he's made. It was the H4, I'll be sure to put up a picture. Um, there were multiple times that Ferdinand Bertu attempted to go and uh, see John Harrison and ironically John Harrison, well not ironically, John Harrison really just didn't want to show him the H4, which was one of his latest uh, sea clocks. Um, he tried many times to, to see it. Um, one time he ended up visiting Harrison and Harrison showed him H1, 2 and 3 but refused to show him H4. So um, Bertu really had a hard time with um, the task of, of creating a, a sea clock because he didn't see, couldn't see the latest technology that was going on. There was actually an English horologist named Thomas Mudge who a uh, friend number two ended up reaching out to and Mudge um, explained the H4's working, working principles to Bertu which allowed, um, which allowed Bertu to uh, create the sea clocks that the king had requested. Um, so uh, a hard time to, to kind of get get introduced to, to C chronometers and seeing the latest technologies that we're going about. Um, John Harrison probably is another watchmaker that I should cover, so um, perhaps in a later episode we will, but I mean, you have to think of it from Harrison's perspective as well. You know, he is one of the, he was an extremely well-renowned um, maker of C chronometers. And if you are an expert in that field, you probably don't want to share it unless you're gonna be getting something out of it. And I don't think Harrison felt like he was. So um, it makes sense, but um, Bertu ended up getting the information that he needed. And then in uh, 1766, uh, Bertu had uh, outlined the clocks that he was going to make and um, proposed the financing that was needed in order to make them. And the King of France ended up uh, approving both the uh, financing as well as the uh, clocks that he was going to produce. And so he went to work and um, 
you know, as he does, two years later in 1768, he ended up having one of the clocks uh, completed and he gave it to Charles Pierre Claret, who was one of the king's explorers. And it was a massive success. It was, it worked exactly how the sea chronometer needs to work. And um, uh, Claret reported uh, back to the king that it was working the way it should. And, um, you know, with that stamp of approval from one of the king's um, closer, um, closer individuals and someone who, um, you know, is using this watch for exploring and, and uh, was on, you know, boats and, and sailing very regularly. That really was a stamp of approval for Bertu and Bertu's um, kind of his success continued from there. You know, he created more, more and more uh, sea clocks for the king. I mean, there were multiple ships that were using his sea clocks, the um, Bertu's sea clocks by commission of, from the king. And he continued to produce them and kind of create his little business around that. Um, so that was kind of the main thing is that he was very influential in the French, the French sea, um, sea chronometers that were used um, on their sailboats. So um, very, very integral part of sea clocks within French history, but also just sea clocks in general. There are various uh, variations that he made um, and they, they, they were all a, a raving success. Um, other things that he, he did, he actually created an equation of time clock in 1752 at age 25. You know, age 25 for a watchmaker is extremely young. Uh, to do something like an equation of time really shows that he was extremely educated and, and his apprenticeship was uh, doing exactly what, what it needed to do and he learned the necessary things to make something that's not the easiest uh, to accomplish. So made the, at age 25, he was already making the equation of time clocks. Um, like I said, he was also extremely influential in um, driving um, literature of, of watchmaking. Um, a lot of that literature is used uh, today. Bertu was um, wrote very, I, a couple of books, uh, quite a few books, um, explaining uh, how uh, watches are put together and how um, you know certain things come together within a watch. And those, uh, like I said, are used uh, even to this day. Um, are used to, uh, uh, to 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 drive the the creation of, of modern of wa modern watches. People probably don't go back and read them very often because now that they kind of understand what's going on and, and that, all of that. Um, but uh, yeah, another uh, extremely uh, important person when it comes to, comes to the literature of, of, of modern watchmaking. Um, and then um, he ended up dying um, in 1807 on June 20th. Sorry, that sounded extremely morbid. He unfortunately passed away in 1807 um, on June 20th in uh, Grosley. Uh, this, you know, if he was born in 1727, you know, he lived a, a fairly long life. What is that? Uh, 73, um, 80 years. He, he died at age 80, which, um, you know, that's a that's a very long life, especially if you go back to, um, you know, the 18th century. People weren't living as long. Some of the other watchmakers that we've discussed haven't didn't live for 80 years, um, so had a very long life, very fortuitous life, um, very influential in uh, both watchmaking literature, but also in um, creating sea chronometers for, for the for the French king and essentially the, the, the watch market as a whole. Um, you know, uh, I don't think there were any people that, that there were any individuals that took up uh, watchmaking after him and continued his his name, but um, an extremely important person nonetheless within within watchmaking and a true legend. So um, he was a cool person to research. I'll be sure to put up pictures of some of his creations um, so that you can see them. Also, I don't know if you guys saw um, last week, I should have mentioned it in the in Wednesday's video and Monday's video, but Buzzle World has been postponed for the year of 2020 um, because of the out uh, coronavirus outbreak. The Swiss government decided to <clears throat> um, uh, ban meetings of people more than... Uh, the Swiss government banned um, the gathering of more than a thousand people, and obviously <laughs> Buzzle World was a little bit more than a thousand people, so... Uh, they're postponing that until the crisis has kind of been averted. Uh, so uh, postponing Basel World, um, we'll see what happens. Um, so uh, just wanted to give you that piece of uh, news as well. Um, if you've made it this far and you haven't already, be sure to uh, subscribe to our channel if you like these types of videos. We create videos about watches, about any topic that you think that you can think of. Let me know in the comments if there's a video that you want me to create and I'll be sure to create it. Also, right by that subscribe button is the like button. Let's smash it for uh, Fernando too and his contribution to watchmaking. 
And with that said, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video, and until next time.